How are you doing today? Amazing. After that praise and worship, you're going to see it. That's, how are you doing today? Good. Yeah, all right. We even got someone in the bleachers over there. All right. Well, it's uh, my name is Brian. I'm the lead pastor here at Mill Tree. And uh, it is great to have you here with us this morning. Father, we love you. We, know, we don't love just who you are. We love uh, we love that you that you are capable. We love that you are more than willing. Uh, we love everything about you, not just you. We love everything about you. And God, we call on you now this morning. The one who created us, the one who who shaped us, the one that had plans in mind for us. That, that gave us giftings and abilities and, and spiritual gifts. Lord, we call on you this morning to ready our hearts and speak to us because honestly, Lord, we desire to know you and to be known by you. And so God, speak to us. We uh, remove the scales from our eyes and the things blocking our ears from, from understanding and from, from perceiving you. We love you. Be with us this morning. In Jesus' name, everyone said, Amen. 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 Well, hey, uh, I'm going to just jump right into things. We're going to be starting and looking at Mark chapter 2. So as you're turning there, I'm going to just kind of set things up. And this is what's happening because it's the second chapter in Mark. And uh, so this is the beginning. We're only one chapter deep into the book. And so this is the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. He's just kind of started. He's 30 years old and he's just starting things. And he's going around and he's, he's cast out evil spirits out of people. And he's healing people that couldn't walk, people that couldn't see. You know, He's doing all these things and rumor is starting to spread. Word is starting to spread that there's this miracle worker in town. He can do amazing things. So his name is starting to get known. And teachers of the law are starting, the religious leaders are starting to hear about this. And so people, uh, Jesus is in a city called Capernaum. It's a fishing community. It's on next to the Sea of Galilee, small town, and uh, and so Jesus is staying there, and he's staying at this guy's name, this guy named Peter. Uh, ends up being a, a very solid disciple of Jesus's. Uh, staying at Peter's house, and I'm just going to show you. This is a picture of Peter's house. This is the traditional historical uh, view. Uh, what is held to be Peter's house um, for historically, and so you can see that there's kind of like a rock base, but. The houses weren't made of rock back then. They were made of clay and, and uh, like straw and grass. And so that made up the house, and this is kind of an irregular shape. Uh, I can't quite tell. It looked like it's an octagon or something. But if you go to the next slide, houses back then were tri typically, this is like a blue collar house, uh, just an average worker's house. And it was kind of a square shape, and it had two floors. And at night, they'd bring the animals in, and they'd you know, bring them inside to the house, and that's what the, they'd stay. And then on the roof, it was just a flat roof. Again, everything made of clay and, and uh, straw and stuff. And so, but a lot of times in, the, in, the, in this world, the ancient world, they, they'd do things up on the roof, and they, they would have social events and gatherings, and then they would have this life up there. So that is the setting of what we're getting ready to uh, set up and read. And so um, Mark chapter 2 is where we are looking. And again, this is Peter's house that we're looking at. Mark chapter 2, verse 1. And let me... Here we are. Okay. Mark chapter 2, verse 1. It says this. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. He's at Peter's house. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. So Jesus was inside uh, at that house, and, and it was so packed inside. And this was, again, just how things were in Jewish tradition. You know, people could just come over. You didn't have to be invited. People would come over. And the hospitality was a very important thing. So people gathered to hear Jesus, this new miracle worker, uh, hear about him and who he was and what he's about. And he preached the word to them. Verse 3, it says, Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it, and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. I'm going to jump to verse 10, the second part, 10b. So he said to the man, 
I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. And this amazed everyone. And they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. So the setting is this. It's a crowded room. Uh, and there's this man that is paralyzed. We don't know why he's paralyzed. We don't know if he was born that way. We don't know if he's riding his big wheel without a helmet. We don't know if he had a stroke when he was older. We don't know why. All we know is that this guy could not get around on his own. He was immobile. He, he had to be carried. If he wanted to get anywhere, he had to go by this mat. This mat had years of sweat stains on it. It had his, his body print inside of it. He had bed sores from it. This man could not move. This, this mat was his home. So here's this man who's paralyzed, incapable of getting around. And, and I know many of us, we don't identify with that in a, in a physical sense, but we do identify that with that paralysis in a social, in a spiritual and soul kind of way. There are areas in our lives where we experience paralysis. And what I mean by that is what Scripture would call sin. Scripture talks about the separation that is caused from a relationship with God. And that separation causes isolation and loneliness and a brokenness with God. And that's what we're talking about our subject matter is the Delmar divide. Well, really that divide is a fallout and a result, a symptom of a brokenness here. There is brokenness and division here relationally with one another because there is a brokenness and separation here. And that separation causes loneliness. It causes this isolation to occur. And uh, I'm not saying this. I'm not saying if you feel lonely that you have sin in your life. But I will say if you have sin in your life, it causes loneliness. Because sin is nothing other than you know, the separation from God and it causes you to hide and it causes you to contain things. And you know this in your relationships with one another. If there is sin or something that you do not want another person to know about you, a brokenness, a weakness, a sin, an infraction, you kind of cover that and, and hide it and it causes this separation and this isolation. And so um, there are areas in our lives where we have this paralysis of our own. The sin in our lives. And, and it, the interesting thing about sin is that sometimes it doesn't affect every area. Sometimes it, we can be really strong if, if, if when we're alone. We, we can be really strong in some areas, but incredibly weak in other areas of our life. If left to ourselves, we are very capable in handling maybe finances, but we're very weak in other uh, in other areas of temptation. We may, when left to ourselves, we may come to power, come to realize, you know, certain things are given to us, let's say, in the area of power, and you may somehow drift evil in these things. You may, we all have a natural drift towards what is sinful and broken and evil, and, and, and uh, but some of us are, in some ways, kind of weaker. We almost have a hernia in some areas where we just tend to drift more in, in, in certain areas. So, like say financially, some of you, if you get money, you are just naturally drift towards greed, or will naturally drift towards manipulation, or, or twisting, or in other areas, maybe it's if you receive some uh, special recognition, you just all of a sudden drift towards lying and cheating, and you know, uh, different areas in our lives, we, we have a natural prone to weakness. Uh, more in, in some ways than in others. And, uh, and so we have this paralysis that is in us. And so we see this man who is paralyzed, and, but we know the end of the story looks like this. The end of the story, this man who couldn't walk picks up his mat and walks out. He's healed. So what happens in between the beginning and the end? And that's what we're going to look at real briefly. And what happens is this. How did he get there? is he has four buddies. He has four friends who love him. Let me ask with this. Let me just leave with this. Have you ever experienced that just that life-giving community? And what I mean by that, have you ever been surrounded by people who love God and love you? And they will do anything for those. Have you ever experienced that because it's life-changing? And I'm talking, I'm not, I'm not, it, a lot of times it's not even the people that you expect. It, some of the best and the, the most 
the greatest investment in my life has been in relationships with people I would have never chosen to be with. I mean, I'm talking about older people that I wouldn't go hang out with them, I wouldn't go play with them. But they sat down with breakfast with them and they invest in me. Or, you know, people that are just totally different, maybe they're artsy or maybe they're logical, maybe I don't know whatever the opposite of you is, but you get around these people and you just don't naturally have anything that clicks. But because you love God and they love you, there's something that resonates and brings something out of you. Have you been a part of that community before? And it's a different thing. I mean, there's almost layers to community. There's the kind of relationships where you get together and you talk sports, you talk weather, you talk career, you talk that stuff, and that's almost a surfacing. Then there's like this other layer beyond that that's, hey, tell me how you're doing. Tell me about your day. Man, I'm sorry to hear that you got, you know, your diagnosis. That is, that's awful. You know, you know I'm sorry to hear about. That's another layer, but the community we're talking about here it's not only the one that just know, you know, can talk and have fun with you. It's not only the one that just sits and listens to you, can hear you, can empathize and sympathize. They are the ones that when you share something that's hurting you, they hurt with you. That somehow when you share, man, this is going on in my life, it's evoking that in them. It's though they are hurting themselves. It's, and it's not just a single relationship. Have you been in a community like that? Because it changes your life. It takes, and it, 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 it moves from just being you to a them thing. And it's a very imperative thing, and Scripture is highlighting this here. Where this guy who was paralyzed had something in his life that was he could not do. He was immobile on his own. He has a group of people come around him. And they notice there's this obstruction. They said, we need, we're going to do anything we can to get you to go. Because we love God, we love you. And there's this obstruction we see in this story. There's this obstruction. Jesus is in this room, big crowd of people, and then them on the outside. We're going to do whatever it takes to get you to Jesus. We're going to do whatever it takes because we believe the answer, the cure to your problem, the isolation, the loneliness, the paralysis in your life, the deepest form of poverty, loneliness, have you been there? It affects everyone. It doesn't matter what side of your Delmar you're on. Loneliness is one of those things that affects everyone. It doesn't matter what color you are. It doesn't matter how big your wallet is. It doesn't matter. It's, it's, it affects everyone. And uh, so these guys, they, they team up and they say, we're going to do whatever it takes. They climb this roof, the roof of the house, and they begin breaking through the clay, ripping out the grass and the straw, and take this hole. And all the while they're doing this, they're bleeding for him. They're cutting themselves. There's gashes on their hands. They're straining their back as they lower this man. They're suffering for this man, their buddy, to get him before Jesus. Have you been a part of that kind of community before? And these guys are intentional. To have this kind of community, you have to be intentional with them. That kind of community just doesn't happen unless there's some sort of resolve to be invested in. And if you're not, if you, the, the thing about this kind of community is these people are vulnerable with one another. They're honest. They're sharing, hey, here's what's really going on. Here's the real thoughts. And it, may, it will make me sound like a hypocrite, but I'm trying to be honest here. And these people will take and not hold you to it. I mean, they're not going to hold it above your head and lord it, but hey, hey, you know, they're not, it's not going to sneak out and get away from that relationship. It's not going to spread through the vine. That kind of relationship we need. And here's the thing. As they're lowering this, their buddy down in the roof, Jesus says something. Look at verse 5. This is a, a neat verse. It says this. When Jesus saw their faith, it says, when Jesus saw their faith, I think we limit as believers, in our seeking God, we limit it to my faith. This is your faith. This is my faith. But Jesus says something very interesting. He says, their faith. And I think my faith, I think your faith needs a little bit of their faith in it. 
In fact, I would go on to say, sometimes your faith is ineffective because there's not their faith in it. You may have prayers that you're praying. You may have things that God has put on your heart that are not being achieved because it's only limited to your faith. You probably need a little more of their faith. You need those around you who are going to be knowing it, knowing you, suffering, but loving God too, and going to go to God with you, bringing you to Jesus. You need their faith in your life. It's not just a good idea. You need that. There are some things you're going to be remaining paralyzed in your life until you get their faith around you. Because on your own, you're going to drift evil. On your own, you're going to drift sin, brokenness, because that is separation from God. And so, friends, this morning, this is an important thing. The result and byproduct of this, if people, if, the, if this community sees, we are, we're so diverse in here, in so many ways. If the world sees a group like this that shouldn't naturally relate, praising God, loving each other in a deep way, in the way we've talked about. If the world sees that, you know what it communicates? God is real and God is there. Because it's not something that we can evoke out of ourselves, but it's something that God does in 